I'm Tom Poles. Thank you for inviting me. Today, I'm going to talk about a year in review in urothelial cancer. Um, I've called it improving outcomes because we've had two big randomized trials which have shown a survival benefit. And, uh, and I'm going to talk, obviously, a lot about those. But there's some other subtle things around other ADCs and other approaches, which I'm going to talk about also. I think the first place to start is the standard of care as it currently stands is platinum-based chemotherapy followed by maintenance of Alimab. That uh, is based on this randomized phase three Javelin trial, where patients whose cancers had not progressed after four to six cycles of chemotherapy were then randomized to Avalimab or best supportive care. Um, this um, is established and I think is widely used. And there have been a series of updated analyses associated with these, the most recent of which was the updated overall survival signal, which shows a consistent and persistent improvement in overall survival a 25% reduction in the risk of death, about a 50% reduction in the risk of progression. I think it's likely that somewhere between 40 and 50% of patients who um, are treated for metastatic urothelial cancer are potentially eligible for um, maintenance of Alimab. Uh, that's a really important issue. Um, I think it's preferential to giving first, um, second line therapy. I also think it's preferential to monotherapy immune checkpoint inhibition. Um, so this is a Goldilocks effect. It's not too late. It's not too early. Uh, there've been some recent um, subgroup analysis of this population showing it walk, 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 working across broad subgroups of patients. His adverse event profile, uh, about 10% of patients getting uh, you know, significant toxicity, but all of these drugs are associated with some adverse events. And then this is very small, um, but essentially this is the most recent update from ASCO GU just recently. And here you can see um, outcomes in subgroups of patients, um, and this is some of the longer-term outcome. And you can see from here the conclusions are that even in the most recent update, this is working across broad subgroups of patients remains the standard of care. And these data, focusing on patient-reported outcomes, show that maintenance of Valimab is not associated with a major decrease in quality of life. You might say, how can a drug with known side effects not be associated with a decrease in quality of life? And I think partly that's because the tools we have to assess quality of life are perhaps less good than we'd like them to be. Because as I said before, about 10% of patients do have life-changing Toxicity, significant toxicity with immune checkpoint inhibition, but the, the tools we currently have perhaps are imperfect to assess that. Um, Neil, you got a question? Yeah, I just wonder if you could break down a little bit in terms of the patients not eligible. I assume a big part of that or the main part of it is there people who have progressed or not responding to initial chemotherapy. Are there other you know patients that fit in that category? Yeah, Neil, that's a great question. I think I think it's true that all patients should have a go at immune therapy because we don't know who the responding patients and we don't know the patients who don't respond are. So when patients are not able to have a go at immune therapy, I think that's a problem, number one. Uh, number two is the biomarker research has been really, really challenging. It's not been successful. And um, we've tried PDL1 as a biomarker. We've tried tumor mutational burden. We've tried a string of other biomarkers. And I can tell you, none of them are really prime time ready. And so the key question here is, you know, which patients are not able to get immune therapy or this approach? And as you said, it's actually mainly those that progress on chemotherapy. Many people say to me, hold on a second, Tom, but only 20% of patients progress on immune therapy. And that's actually not correct. 20% of patients progress on the first CT scan with immune therapy, with, with chemotherapy. But with chemotherapy, you give six cycles, and that's the first scan, and there's 10% progress there, and then the second scan. And actually, if you look from the first scan between cycle three and cycle six, about 30% of patients have some progression during that period of time. And that's how you get closer to that 50%. Of course, 10% of patients are not well enough to have it because of comorbidities. Their performance status has deteriorated. Some patients have had such a difficult time with chemotherapy, they choose not to have it. And that's when the numbers go down from, you know, people say, well, it should be 70%. I said, no, maybe 50%, but then 10% don't want it, and then 10% can't have it, and 10% on well enough. And that's when you get the real world maintenance of Alimab data, which is closer to 20 or 30%.
So we're leaving behind some patients with this approach, but this approach is better than all of the other options we've had in front of us until recently. Remember, the atezolizumab chemotherapy combination trial was essentially negative for overall survival, and most of the benefit appeared to be coming from the maintenance phase. And that, importantly, was also true for the 361 trial, the pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy, where, again, it's a negative trial with no survival benefit and most of the benefit coming from the maintenance phase. The key question which people ask me is, why is chemotherapy and immune therapy not being additive in bladder cancer when the combination has worked so well in lung cancer and other tumor types? And you know, Neil, we don't know the answer to that question, but there's probably something unique in the tumor microenvironment. We might talk about this at the end. We have an excluded phenotype predominantly in urothelial cancer. That means the T cells don't get into the tumor. They're on the outside of the tumor. And it might be that this phenotype means the combination with chemotherapy is not synergistic. So, yeah, I guess that leads into the next paper, which I'm really curious to hear you discuss, particularly in light of what you just said. So this is a really uh, great piece of work from um, the um, nivolumab group. And here we've combined platinum-based chemotherapy but it's cisplatin. It's not gemcis and carbo. It's only gemcis with nivolumab, and we've compared it to gemcis alone. Um, and you can see here the other key part to this trial, again, maintenance nivolumab is given after chemotherapy. Now, I just showed you a 25% reduction in the risk of death in, in perhaps 50% of patients associated with that maintenance period. So, Anything positive in this trial from a survival perspective, part of and, and, and PFS, part of that at least is going to be driven by this maintenance period. The question is how much of that is driven by maintenance and how much by the combination? And I hope I'm going to explain that to you today. And here you can see a significant overall survival advantage. We didn't see that in the two previous trials with chemotherapy combinations. This here is a 22% reduction in the risk of death. Maintenance of Valimab in unselected patients, assuming about half of them get it, is probably associated with about a 12% reduction in the risk of death. I said overall it's a 25% reduction, but only half the patients get maintenance of Valimab, so 25 divided by 2, call it 12. So here, a 12% reduction in the risk of death associated with Valimab, and this is a greater than 12%. This is a 22% reduction in the risk of death. So it's within the ballparks of all coming from that maintenance period. Can we convince ourselves that the cisplatin and the nivolumab is doing something on top of that maintenance period, which we didn't see with pembrolizumab and we didn't see with atezolizumab? And actually, the results is it's not crystal clear. It's basically walk, working across broad groups of subpatients. And it's important to remember the cisplatin population have a better quality of life, they're better performance status than the carboplatin patients. So we're picking the winners a bit. So it might be that actually the good patients are doing better with the immune therapy. I understand that. Also, the progression-free survival is significantly better. And again, we don't know how much of this is coming to the maintenance period. Neil, I draw your attention, chemotherapy is given for about six months, it's actually given for about four months. And here you can see the progression-free survival curve doesn't go apart until the chemotherapy stops. And so if that's the case, those who believe that all the benefit is coming from the maintenance period will show this curve and say, actually, the PFS benefit is only really marked after the chemotherapy stops. So the benefit here is mainly driven by the maintenance phase. But that's not entirely true because the response rate and the CR rate for the combination is about 10% higher than for the chemotherapy alone. So the believers believe that there is an additive effect or a small additive effect because the response rate is higher. And those people who doubt this because the other two trials have been negative say actually the progression-free survival curve shows that most of the benefit is coming from the maintenance period. And here are the response data, and you can see the responses are a little bit higher. And again, if you are a person who says, listen, I want most patients to get a go at immune therapy in the chemotherapy era, era, you might say this is a good way of doing it, because at least using this approach, you know everyone's getting a crack at immune therapy. If you're a purist, a statistical purist, you'd come back and say, actually, overall, 
most of the survival benefit is probably coming from the maintenance period and you don't need to do this. And I would broadly agree with that. I've done a little bit of work to see if we could have seen this result coming. I've said before, we've had a negative atezolizumab study and a negative pembrolizumab trial in the overall population, gem cis, gem carbo. What happens when we look at the atezolizumab and pembrolizumab trial in the cis platin only population? And here you can see actually the atezolizumab uh, has the lowest um, OS hazard ratio and the pembrolizumab trial has the lowest PFS hazard ratio. Now, these neither of those are statistically significant because that's not how these trials were designed. But I put it to you that actually the other trials showed very similar effects. So this isn't a black swan event associated with nivolumab that's totally unexpected. When we looked at the subset to the previous trials in this space, we could have predicted that a well-powered trial looking exclusively at the cisplatin population probably would have been positive. There's some preclinical work to suggest that cisplatin is different from carboplatin, but there's also that other factor, the cisplatin patients have better performance status and they tend to do better than the carboplatin population, and that might be driving this. The challenge again, though, when we look at where this benefit is coming from is actually, from a PFS perspective, the curves for all three of these only really go apart in the maintenance period. So for all of the positivity I've said, suggesting there may be something additive in this combination with cisplatin alone, actually, at least part of the benefit, if not all of it, is coming from that maintenance phase. And that's why many people look at the chemo NEVO data, the cisplatin NEVO data, and say, actually, most of the benefit comes from maintenance of Alimab. I'm going to stick to maintenance of Alimab. Thank you very much. I think both approaches are very reasonable as things currently stand. When you look at the gem cis and sorry, the gem cis immune therapy data and the gem carbo immune therapy data, and you look for differences in CR, differences in response, PFS and OS hazard ratios, actually you can see in broad terms there are more similarities. Maybe the cisplatin population is performing a little bit better than the carboplatin population. But overall, I think it's fair to say that there is a degree of antagonism between chemotherapy and immune therapy. That's probably slightly less marked with cisplatin. At least part, if not all, of the benefit is coming from the maintenance phase. So you don't need to give cisplatin and nivolumab it's very acceptable to say I'm sticking with Evalimab. But if you come back and said, this is the approach I'd like to pursue, I think that's entirely reasonable. So uh, trying to digest this, um, I guess one question that comes to my mind is, can you envision the possibility that people, for example, if you think about the Javelin model, can you envision the possibility that patients who progress on chemotherapy might actually benefit from IO uh, in the maintenance setting? Or it would be second-line therapy, depending on how you're looking at it. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So, Neil, let me put it to you a different way. When we started developing immune therapy, we were hoping that we would cure a big group of patients with immune therapy alone. And we hoped it would be about 30% of patients. As it transpires, it looks like second-line single-agent immune therapy is too late for most patients. Only about 15% or 20% of patients get it. Upfront immune therapy is not good enough at getting control of the disease. We lose patients along the way. And actually, we put some patients in harm's way. Combining chemotherapy and immune therapy showed some antagonism and for those patients who progress on chemotherapy, we rescue very few of those with subsequent immune therapy. It just takes too long for the immune therapy to work. And so we've ended with maintenance of Valumab, which didn't fulfill our ambition. We wanted to do better than that. And when you look at the survival of, for example, the Nivolumab trial that just came out and previous studies, particularly the 361 trial in the gem cis, gem carbo population, overall survival is remained stubborn at somewhere between a year and a year and a half. 
And actually, when we go back in time and we go back five years, the survival of bladder cancer was still about 12 months. So immune therapies probably made some benefit and made a huge benefit for some patients. But when we look at the whole population, survival remains poor. I do kidney cancer too. When we started, the survival of kidney cancer and bladder cancer was about the same. Kidney cancer is now five years. And until recently, bladder cancer was stuck at somewhere between a year and a quarter and a year and a half. And so immune therapy didn't fulfill our expectations. So just to kind of put this all together, particularly in terms of a practical message here, it sounds like if it weren't for EV Pembro, we would still be in maintenance of Alumab, at least from your point of view? I think maintenance of Alumab for all comers is entirely reasonable. I think for those who said, look, I like the increased response with nivolumab and cisplatin, I'm totally bought into that. For those who said, look, Tom, 20% CR rate. I want that for my patients. I'm totally bought into that. But I don't think it's essential. And from an overall survival perspective, the hazard ratio of 0.78, 22% reduction in the risk of death, with a Valiumab probably being accounting for at least 12% of that, means if there are benefits with cisplatin and nivolumab during that initial chemotherapy phase, those benefits are relatively modest And we saw similar benefits for pembrolizumab and atezolizumab, and we didn't jump all over those. All right, please continue. EV302. So this is a different study. Infortumab vedotin is an antibody drug conjugate. It's not platinum-based chemotherapy. It's given as a single agent. It's almost certainly the most active single agent drug we have in urothelial cancer. It has 40% response rates as a monotherapy in platinum refractory disease. Pembrolizumab is an immune checkpoint inhibitor. We know a lot about pembrolizumab. In fortunately, we have a dotin targets nectin-4. 98% of urothelial cancers overexpress nectin-4. When you give these two drugs together in phase two data, you can get 7 to 68% response rates in the frontline setting. Gem Carbo, and it was tried in that Gem Carbo population, probably 40 to 45% responses. So when we saw these 70% responses in phase two, we thought, wow, this looks really impressive. We think we can beat platinum-based chemotherapy, GEMSYS or GEMCARBO, with this new combination. It's an ambitious trial because we've tried for 40 years to beat platinum-based chemotherapy, and we've not had success. So this is a randomized phase three in frontline patients, GEMSYS or GEMCARBO eligible patients with progression-free survival and overall survival as the primary endpoint. EV Pembro continued until progression. It was given on a day one and day eight cycle. The progression-free survival showed a 55% reduction in the risk of progression. I said before, overall survival was stuck at about a year. And here we show in unselected patients, the progression-free survival is a year. And we can also see this curve plateau at about 40%. You can see the control arm and 30% of patients in the control arm got maintenance of Valimab, but unfortunately the control arm is coming down to pretty much 10%. So this is a seismic change in progression-free survival. And then when we move forward and look at overall survival, we can see a really big difference, a 53% reduction in the risk of death, a hazard ratio of 0.47. It says here the median is 31, but if you look, the tail of that curve is pretty unstable. And the median, I think, is probably going to end up closer to 35 months, closer to three years. Whereas the control arm, which actually performed at 16 months, as I said before, that control arm is better than control arms we've seen before for GEMSYS or GEMCARBO. That's probably being driven by the 30% who got maintenance of Alimab, and that's struggling to keep up at 16 months. And so essentially, this is the new way of looking at urothelial cancer. Patients having an opportunity to get close to three years than one year in overall survival with a 50% increase in survival. It works irrespective of the type of chemotherapy, GEMSYS or GEMCARBO. It beat both of them easily. And it works irrespective of the pd one biomarker. 
It works across broad subgroups of patients, irrespective of platinum chemotherapy, upper tract disease or lower tract disease, cisplatin eligibility, performance status. The response rate close to 70% with a 30% CR rate. You know, these, these are data points we've not seen before in urothelial cancer. As I said before, the control arm performed really quite well. And it's really important also to look at the subsequent therapy, and you can see the control arm getting quite a lot of subsequent immune therapy, whereas in the EV Pembro arm, those patients that did progress were switched back to platinum-based chemotherapy. The adverse event profile, the oval survival curve is the most important curve, really, for me, but the event adverse event profile is equally important because this is the new standard of care. I think patients and doctors will want to give this to their patients. But it is associated with different toxicity associated with it compared to platinum-based chemotherapy. My experience of platinum-based chemotherapy was difficult to give. Um, platinum is associated with neutropenia, and you can see here neutropenia, pancytopenia, is associated with sepsis, is associated with renal toxicity, is associated with really bad nausea. We know we had to go out and develop nausea um, drugs to give to these patients to, to control their nausea. It's associated with fatigue. So that's why actually the adverse events are more common with chemotherapy than EV Pembro. But EV Pembro has different toxicity. It has peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy seems to accumulate with cycles. And once you get to between six and 10 cycles, most patients are beginning to get a type of neuropathy. It's a sensory and a motor neuropathy. I really encourage you to stop giving the drug if that's the case, put it on hold, and you'll find the neuropathy gets slowly better. And you can potentially re-challenge after that. And of course, it's associated with skin toxicity, nectin 4 is expressed in the skin. And during the first three cycles, skin rash is really prominent and we need to be really aware of it. And again, do not treat through skin toxicity because you get into trouble. But my experience is hold, let the skin toxicity resolve and then re-challenge at a lower dose and you can keep going on the drug. So really important as we bring this into the community that we educate and train around adverse events. Neil. Any issues in terms of sort of figuring out what's going on with these patients? For example, IOs can cause dermatologic toxicities. Yeah, well, it's a great question and it's a difficult question to answer, speaking frankly. What I can tell you, and we've treated about 20 patients with the combination, what I can tell you is that the skin toxicity with immune, um, with pembrolizumab as a single agent, tends to be um, associated with a different type of rash. It tends to be um, a relatively mild rash. It can have a very bad total body type of rash. Whereas this EV Pembro rash, it tends to, once it becomes significant, cause skin blistering. If you treat through it, the skin can actually blister. And indeed, you can get um, more Stephen Johnson type syndrome eventually. So it is actually a distinct rash. I think it does have an immune component to it because I feel it is more common with the combination or you need to be more prominent. It's more prominent with the combination. But you're absolutely right. There'll be an EV rash, but there'll still be potentially an immune-related rash that's different and may not be associated with its occurrence in the first three cycles. My advice to investigators who don't have, or clinicians who don't have huge experience of this is to say, err on the side of caution, particularly in a rash in the first three cycles. Don't give EV through this rash. Put both drugs on hold. If you're not sure, give steroids. There's little harm in doing that. And certainly, if you're really not sure, it would be a mistake to say, I'm definite this is EV, I won't give steroids. I don't think steroids are a good treatment for EV-related rash by itself. Our experience for that hasn't been good. But you won't do patients harm by giving steroids if you think there's a small chance this is immune-driven by pembrolizumab. So just kind of curious, uh, you know, there was a period of time when EV Pembro was only available to patients who were not uh, platinum eligible or cisplatinum eligible. And it, when that, at that point in time, I was saying to myself, I think that's what I want. If, you know, I had bladder cancer. I'm curious at what point along the line you started to think this is going to blow away Javelin. Oh, well, I think 
so my personal experience is I thought it was going to blow away Javelin when we took part in the study because we were treating patients and they were going to durable remissions. Um, many of our patients came off therapy and they continued in those durable remissions. Uh, and we, you know, I saw a patient yesterday, a really sweet man uh, and his wife, who, you know, we treated three years ago. And they're now on single agent pembrolizumab. They've stopped the infortumab vedotin. They've now stopped the Pembro 2 because it stopped after two years. And uh, they um, and they are in a, a durable remission with small lymph node-only disease uh, that's negative on PET. And, um, and so I think it, for me, I thought it was going to show this. You can never tell in clinical trials. That's the beauty of big randomized trials across hundreds of sites. But I thought it was going to be uh, transformative and I think it is transformative and your observation is correct if you are a patient in uh, in the United States right now with frontline urethelial cancer you'd want to have this regime instead of platinum based chemotherapy which means maintenance of Alimab is deprioritized because you're never going to get there and one of the questions I get asked is are there EV Pembro patients are there platinum patients and are there Pembrolizumab monotherapy patients. And what I can tell you is the following. There are not that many patients who are eligible for platinum-based chemotherapy that would not be eligible for EV Pembro because platinum-based chemotherapy has its own challenges. Now, you might say, what about those patients with an active skin rash on immune-suppressive agents? But I'd come to you and say, yeah, they can have platinum-based chemotherapy, but that's not going to be super easy. But you can't give those patients maintenance of Alimab either. You can't give someone on active immune therapy, active immune suppressive drugs. You know. So, um, you know, a renal transplant patient, for example, you might say you can't give them EV Pembro. And then you say, okay, we can give, we can give them Gem Cis or Gem Carbo, depending on their renal function, probably Gem Carbo. Um, but you wouldn't want to give them Pembrolizumab or, or Valimab either. So the question there is, I think this supersedes Gem Cis or Gem Carbo. And then the more difficult question that comes from that is, are there single agent Pembro patients? And I think the answer to that is there probably might still be some patients, you know, two years after a relapse with lymph node only disease and a performance status of two, not feeling great. And let's say they've got many multiple comorbidities and their life expectancy is two or three years. You might say, why not have a go with single agent immune checkpoint inhibition, see if we can get control of disease. Um, and, and, and I think that's probably 5% of patients. Um, the other bit I think that's relevant is there were quite a lot of gem carbo patients before. And we'd say to them, look, we'll give you gem carbo, about a 50% chance of progressing with problems, about a 20% chance of getting immune therapy. Um, you need the drugs, but your life expectancy either way is probably less than a year. You know, liver mets, lots of problems. And, and those patients, many of those patients, I think in the community say, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if I want those drugs. I find my performance status is going to be a lot worse. You're not going to be able to offer me very much life extension. You know, without the drugs, maybe six months. With the drugs, maybe nine months, maybe a year. You can see patients, or I've had patients come back and said, you know, they're 78 years old or 85 years old, and they've got they've got on half a dozen different agents. And they said, look, I've had a good time. I'm going to, you know, I don't want to spend the last six months of my life battling through chemotherapy. EV Pembro might be a bit different from that we know we can get good control of those patients and we might be able to transform those patients and the data suggests we can transform those patients into more reasonable outcomes. They're not quite as good as the Gemesis population. So under those circumstances, that conversation might be quite different. So instead of saying you might not make it to a year, you're going to spend most of the time on chemotherapy and there's about a 50% chance of progressing through, we can now say, actually, I think we probably can get some control. Let's have a go and see what happens. So I think it's actually going to expand the proportion of patients. I think it's going to supersede platinum eligibility. And I don't think we're going to be talking about platinum eligibility in the frontline space in the near future. All right, please continue. I'd like to talk briefly about erdofisinib, if I may, because it's been a big year for erdofisinib. It's been somewhat eclipsed by the EV Pembro, um, Gemsis, Nevo frontline data. The THOR trial was a massive undertaking. It was a huge randomized trial in patients whose cancers have progressed either after chemotherapy and immune therapy or progressed after prior immune therapy alone. Essentially, what we showed in the first component of this trial 
where we randomized against paclitaxel or vinflunine for those patients who had had one or two prior lines of therapy, is we showed that erdofitinib, an FGFR inhibitor, in patients whose cancers have FGR alterations, so about one in about two in ten patients, those patients with FGFR alterations who have previously had chemotherapy and immune therapy, this as a third line agent or a second line after chemotherapy and a valumab, this outperforms significantly from a survival perspective, third line single agent chemotherapy. And these data are actually quite impressive. And this is on the left-hand side of this curve. We learned one or two interesting things from this study. Firstly, we showed that those patients who have FGF alterations actually have low pd one expression. We also learned that the erdofitinib is associated with significant toxicity. Just because it's a tablet doesn't make it easy. It causes mucositis and causes nail toxicity. On the right-hand side was the second cohort of this, which was even more intriguing. Because we thought, because patients with FGFR alterations have low pdl one expression, we expected those patients who have had one prior therapy but hadn't had immune therapy before, we thought those patients, erdofitinib, would significantly outperform pembrolizumab. But guess what? Pembrolizumab did perfectly well hazard ratio of 1.18. And what does this tell us? Well, the first thing it tells us is erdofitinib is not the only agent in patients who previously had um, chemotherapy. The erdofitinib should not be sequenced, in my opinion, before immune checkpoint inhibition, irrespective of FGFR status and pd one status. And therefore, when you put these two trials together, what does it tell us? Well, firstly, erdofitinib is an active agent, but pembrolizumab is at least as active, and therefore immune checkpoint inhibition should be prioritized first. And so where does this fit into the patient pathway? Well, in the um, in pre, pre-EV Pembro era, first-line platinum-based chemotherapy, maintenance of valimab or second-line pembrolizumab or tezolizumab, And then if that patient has an FGFR alteration, I think single-agent EV or single-agent erdofitinib are both totally reasonable choices. However, EV-PEMBRO, which is the new era, what do we do after that? Well, I said before, the commonest treatment regime was GEM-CIS or GEM-CARBO. Erdofitinib, we don't know if it's as active, and we haven't used it very much post-EV Pembro. And I think we need to look and do trials prospectively in that population to look at its activity. I think it's a reasonable choice, but I would probably use it currently third line, EV Pembro, platinum-based therapy, erdofitinib. That's my idea. Although my friend Johan Lorio, who's involved in the erdofitinib program, his preference is to give it directly after EV Pembro. So as the landscape has changed within Fortumab Vidotin and Pembrolizumab, so do our subsequent therapies. The level of evidence for the data we have has reduced. Erdofitinib is a reasonable option in this approach. But actually, its strong data is in the previous era with platinum-based chemotherapy. I've also got a second slide, if I may, on erdofitinib. And this is the North study that was presented at ASCO. The reason I present this is many in the audience will say, well, if EV is when you combine EV with immune checkpoint inhibition, we seem to get an unexpectedly good response. What happens in the frontline setting when we combine erdofitinib with immune checkpoint inhibition? And actually, we don't get quite the same bump. So this trial, FGF altered patients, frontline therapy again. And you can see here, In this selected population, erdofitinib plus immune checkpoint inhibition not really significantly outperforming erdofitinib alone. The response rate, yeah, it's 10% higher, not 20% higher. The overall survival, 20 months versus 16 months, not a big difference, and not competing with the EV Pembro, which is more like 30, 35 months. So in summary, Erdofitinib is a single agent. Single agent. It has activity in the disease, 
it's used after immune checkpoint inhibition, not instead of immune checkpoint inhibition. It was previously chemotherapy, erdofitinib, sorry, chemotherapy, evalimab, er, EV or erdofitinib in FGFR altered patients. It's now EV Pembro, platinum based chemotherapy, erdofitinib, in my opinion. It's worthwhile talking also about other ADCs because many in the audience will be saying, well, EV looks fabulous. What about satituzumab, govitecan? This is a different ADC. It targets um, TROP2, which is different from Nectin4, obviously. Heavily expressed in urothelial cancer again. And the payload here is SN38, topoisomerase 1, rather than MMAE. So while it has the same name, an antibody drug conjugate, it's as different as a bus and a tree from, ne- from um, infortumab vedotin. What we see with, uh, with sasituzumab govitecan is response rates are about 25 to 30% in platinum refractory disease. EV's response rate more like 40%. And intriguingly, when we combine it in pretreated patients with immune checkpoint inhibition, we don't see that massive bounce that we saw with EV Pembro. And so therefore, where are we with sasituzumab govitecan? Well, there's a big study called TROPIX-4. TROPIX-4 is a randomized phase three study. It's comparing sasituzumab govitecan with single agent taxane therapy, essentially in the third line therapy, platinum-based chemotherapy, evalimab, and then sasituzumab or chemotherapy. I think it's a really promising agent. We're looking forward to the results of that trial. And if that trial is positive, I think sasituzumab will then become a standard therapy, not just in platinum refractory disease, but I think many will want to use it post EV Pembro as well. It's not without its side effects, particularly hematological side effects, and many people give GCSF support. It's also associated with some nausea, some diarrhea, and some alopecia. One of the exciting things, in my opinion, about infortumab vedotin plus sasituzumab over TCAN, when they're combined together, have response rates of 70%. Now, this is really quite high because it doesn't. It looks like these two are additive on top of each other. And I think ADC doublets, and dare I say it, ADC immune triplets, EV, SG, and pembrolizumab, are going to be a new area of investigation in urothelial cancer. I actually think it's an incredibly exciting time in urothelial cancer because not only have we doubled survival this year, but we've also shown that we can combine these drugs together and we may be able to improve their outcomes even further. And that's why I wanted to talk about this study here. There's another group of ADCs, Decitimab Vedotin. Decitimab Vedotin targets HER2. It has MMAE as the payload. And here you can show about 50% response rates in patients with HER2 expression. Its adverse event profile looks a bit like infortumab vedotin, more like EV associated with the payload, maybe with less skin toxicity. So this is another really exciting monotherapy drug. And this is currently in randomized phase three studies with pembrolizumab in this disease. We've explored it in patients with low expression, and it doesn't look as active in her to low expression. And we've explored it in combination with PD-1 therapy, and we can show response rates again of 70% in pretreated patients. So when you think, oh, are we going to plateau in urothelial cancer because EV Pembro has changed the field for good, I put it to you actually that we're just going through a period of new exciting development. If we could just follow up with a few uh, questions here. Keynote 361. Any comments on this study? So I was involved in this study. Um, this is one of the studies which uh, I've had. Uh, I've been very lucky and very, uh, very in my, in my career, and I've been given the opportunity to lead a number of trials, including um, this study. And, and, and this study was um, perhaps the most important negative trial that we've done. Everyone thought that um, chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab would have similar results as it did in lung cancer. But in bladder cancer, instead of hazard ratios of 0.5s and 0.6s, we got hazard ratios of 0.8s and 0.9s. We explain this by saying the combination of chemotherapy with immune with pembrolizumab 
during that initial phase was largely antagonistic. We went on in this trial also to look at single-agent pembrolizumab, and we showed that pembrolizumab was less good than chemotherapy at getting initial control of disease. And indeed, many patients who got single-agent pembrolizumab progressed quickly and never got the opportunity to have chemotherapy, and that accounts for the crossing of the curves where we're losing some patients initially. There's been some ad hoc analysis from Keynote 361 recently. And I think some of this ad hoc analysis is interesting, looking at patients with CR, looking at um, patients who had just gem cis, looking at different combinations. And I think the results of this trial show actually that if you look at those patients who do well with immune therapy, who respond, we know they do extremely well. And actually, we've shown the same thing in the recent 901 trial with Gemesis nivolumab, in that the responders, the duration of response and the duration of complete response is really quite impressive. And so my takeaway from this is there are a group of patients who are exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy and pembrolizumab and chemotherapy and nivolumab together. Unfortunately, we don't know who they are. And unfortunately, they're relatively infrequent, perhaps one in six to one in eight patients. And therefore, while this approach you can see really works in subgroups, and if we did really great biology, we might be able to identify who these patients are. In fortumab vodotin and pembrolizumab in unselected patients appears to be a more attractive option. From what you can tell, um, do you discern any difference in the outcomes of this trial versus Checkmate 901? Yes, a very important difference. Checkmate 901 is statistically positive and therefore is practice changing. Whereas this trial, all of these analyses are exploratory and therefore um, um, interesting and worthwhile but not practice changing. So it's very important to recognize that GEMSYS NEVO is a positive study and therefore can be given as a standard of care where chemotherapy and pembrolizumab should be considered exploratory. I think at the same time, once we've acknowledged that, which is the most important issue, when we then look at this data, we see more parallels between chemotherapy and pembrolizumab and chemotherapy and nivolumab. But I wouldn't want to take that away from the chemo nevo group who conducted a prospective positive trial because this trial, which I was involved with, was not that. And therefore, it would be unfair of me to say, yes, they're the same. So a couple of questions about HER2 positive disease. In terms of what you showed for desatamab, when you talked about HER2 low by IHC, did you also look at FISH? Unfortunately, only a very small minority of patients are FISH positive in urothelial cancer. It's think. only about 2%. So we don't right. have enough okay. data on that. Back in the day, the UK group did a study called LAM where we screened 500 patients for HER2 with FISH. And we only showed less than 2% were positive. Hmm. And for that reason, we've moved on to IHC. And in fact, probably, well, in that trial, 60% of patients were HER2 positive. Huh, interesting. Another so question, positivity is quite high. Another question is, would you like to have, based on what you're seeing, would you like to have this, this atomavidotin available right now as monotherapy? I think... So I think that's one of the most I could so the answer to that question will take me either two seconds or two hours. I'm gonna go for the two second answer if I may. Because there are so many similarities in terms of the target with EV, until we were recognize whether sequencing DV and EV is associated with activity, I don't think we currently can supersede EV. And so I would be giving EV as monotherapy and EV Pembro instead of DV as monotherapy and DV Pembro. And until we show data that DV works after EV, I would be sequencing EV first. So although it looks the most promising agent out there, we probably need to learn more about sequencing because of the exceptional activity in Fortune Mavidotin. So this is my other question, which is, any thoughts about TDXD 
in uh, urothelial bladder cancer, and would you like to have that available? So TDXD is slightly different because it to- targets topoisomerase 1 um, and not Nectin-4, and therefore it would be reasonable to, with our limited knowledge, and we haven't sequenced TDXD after EV Pembro, but it would be reasonable to collect data on that and, you know, there are people who are looking for these pan-tumor approvals um, for this agent. Um, my experience is urothelial cancer drug activity is challenging. We have used TDXD in urothelial cancer, and we haven't knocked it out of the park, speaking frankly. The results look, in my opinion, not dissimilar to sasituzumab govotecan, maybe a little bit higher. Um, here you can see there is activity in urothelial cancer, But the numbers actually are relatively small. Um, But particularly the 3 plus does look promising, perhaps less so for the all-comers at 39%, but still good. So I think this is a promising drug. I think that I'd like to see it explored more in urothelial cancer. But, you know, Neil, what I'd really like to see is EV Pembro plus TDXD as a triplet. Mm. And then you might have, you know, 80 or 90% response rates complementary targets, triplet therapy. Because in the end, you only get one really good go at urothelial cancer. And when you have second and third line, we're following a law of diminishing returns. 